2.1, tangent lines and rates of change. In this section, we're going to learn how to use the difference quotient to find the slope of a line. To start us off, we've got a formula that should look familiar. It's the point-slope formula, given a point x0, comma, f of x0. We should be able to find the equation of a line. If we're finding the tangent line, we want to choose two points that are close to each other. So we say that x approaches x0. Another way of saying the difference quotient is you know, as h approaches 0. You're more familiar with this one. So in example 1, we're told to use definition 2.1.1. That's the first formula on the previous slide. To find an equation for the tangent line for the parabola of y equals x squared at the point p, 1 comma 1. And confirm the result agrees with that as seen in example 1 of example of section 1.1. 1 .1. Let's take a look at the formula first. In this particular problem, x0 is 1. f of x is x squared. And f of 1 is 1. We get x0 and f of x0 right from the point that was given. Of course, we know how to find this limit. Go ahead and pause the video, try that on your own. We get a slope of 2. Stop there, you're not done. We've got a slope, we've got a point. Go ahead and pause the video, try using the point slope formula to come up with an equation of this line. Once you've got that, we're done. The problem asks you for the equation of the tangent line through the point 1 comma 1, which is what we just did. Example 2 is asking us to find that slope one more time, this time using the difference quotient. I should know how to do this. Go ahead and first figure out what x0 is. Once you know that, figure out f of x0 plus h and f of x0, so we can plug these into the formula. Pause the video and try that part on your own. Once you've got your f of x0 plus h and your f of x0, we can plug them straight into the difference quotient. And as always, things should work out nicely or we did something wrong. I know so I can take an H out of what's on top. I'll plot my H's. H approaches 0, I get 2. This is the same slope I saw in the previous example. Apologies for the sound issues there. What I was trying to say was we need to find out what x0 is, then f of x0 plus h, and f of x0. And that way we can use the difference quotient. In this particular problem, we're given x0 and f of x0. All that's left is figuring out f of x0 plus h, 2 over x plus h. At this point, we can use the difference quotient to find our slope. Once we know our slope, we can use the point-slope formula to calculate the equation of the tangent line. Go ahead, pause the video, try to go through those steps yourself. Your final answer should be a straight line, the equation of a straight line.
And we get our equation of the line. I made a mistake. You may have caught, instead of saying 2 over 2 plus h, up here I accidentally said 2 over x plus h. We happen to know what x was in this problem, so we need to say 2 instead of x right there. Next example is just asking us for the slope. We don't need the equation of the tangent line. The problem is it's asking us for the slope at various points. So instead of starting with what x0 is, let's just say x0 is some arbitrary value x. That way at the end I can plug in values of x. This should be familiar from pre-cal. We're still going to figure out f of x plus h. Still going to figure out what f of x is. We still set up our difference quotient. Say the limit as h approaches 0 of square root of x plus h minus square root of x all over h. You should be able to look at this and think of a strategy. If you thought conjugate, good job. Go ahead and multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. Cancel out what you can. See if you get the same thing I do. get the slope equals 1 over 2 square root of x. So we can use that formula for all three points. We can say at x equals 1, at x equals 4, and at x equals 9. We should be able to get three different slopes. Looking at our diagram, we should be able to believe that the bigger x gets the closer our slope gets to zero. In fact, we're given the numbers right on that picture. Plugging numbers in, we can see that those work. Plugging numbers into the slope formula, 1 over 2 squared x, we do end up getting 1 half, 1 fourth, and 1 sixth. Verify that in your head. Next example talks a little bit about velocity. Velocity is a formula that you've learned before this class. Average velocity is change in position divided by time elapsed. That's different from instant velocity, which is talking about how fast we're going at a specific time. Average velocity is how fast we went on average over a period of time. Let's take a look at what I mean. We're given a function for position. S is in meters, T is in seconds. We want to find the average velocity over two time period intervals. Do one together and then try one on your own. If we're going to find our average velocity, we need to find our ending position minus our starting position. That tells us how far we've gone, how far we've been displaced, and then over how long it took. So ending time minus starting time. Plug in those numbers, see if you get the same thing I do. Pause the video. If you didn't remember your units, be careful on that. Go ahead and pause the video and try the second one on your own. Before moving past this example, I just want to stress one more time, these are average velocities. If we want an instantaneous velocity, we need that denominator to be close to zero because we want no time to have changed at all. That's where some limits are going to come in. To extend on that idea, we're given the same function now. So now we want to know exactly what the velocity is at t equals 2. So that's where a limit comes in. We're going to find the total displacement right around 2 divided by total time elapsed right around 2. So we will end up doing something like the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 divided by h. This will give us the instantaneous velocity when t equals 2. 
looking at the graph, you should be able to guess that that velocity will be negative. We know that because the slope is negative right there. Let's go ahead and go through this process, see if you get the same thing I do. To start off with a hint, you're going to need to figure out that f of 2 plus h and that f of 2. After going through the steps, we end up with a velocity of negative 3 meters per second. I didn't show all my steps for this f of 2 plus h. You should be able to figure that one out on your own. If you go ahead and pause the video here, you can look at some real-world applications of when slopes and rate of change come into play. I put some formulas up here also to illustrate the difference. An average rate of change and an instantaneous rate of change look the same, except instantaneous is a limit where the bottom's getting close to zero. And you could do that either with these formulas or these formulas. The formulas are equivalent. So now let's illustrate the difference between average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change one more time. For average rate of change, we just need to go f of 5 minus f of 3 over 5 minus 3. The bottom is not getting close to zero because we're not looking at a specific moment in time. Whereas on part b, we want the instantaneous rate of change when x equals negative 4, which means we're going to have to find the limit as h approaches 0 of f of negative 4 plus h minus f of negative 4 over h. Get the practice in. Try both of these on your own. See if you get the same thing I do. Go ahead and pause the video. And we end up with our two answers. Once again, I left out the work for calculating f of negative 4 plus h. You should be able to do that on your own. This next example, go ahead and pause the video, read over it, try to understand what it's asking, and then we'll talk it through. One thing that should have stood out the most was part A is asking for an average rate of change. Part B is asking for an instantaneous rate of change. So in part A, we just need the average rate of change, so we need to find out f of... Our x values look like they go from 1,200 on the large end to 300 on the small end. So we just need to know these input values. We can find our average rate of change. Part B, on the other hand, is asking for an instantaneous rate of change. We want to know exactly what's going on at 300. So we look at our graph to see the point where x is 300. And we want to know the slope of that line. Fortunately, two points are given to us. We've got this point over here. Sorry, we've got this point here. 300 comma 13 and up top we've got another point 900 comma 25 so we can calculate the slope of that line and that will help give us this instantaneous slope right there where x is 300 so go ahead and figure out both of those values see if you get the same thing i do go ahead and pause the video And we get our two values. I believe there's one slide that got out of order on this. So before you do a quick check, let's go take a look at the last example. Example 7 says find the rate of change with respect to x if y equals this guy and this guy. <coughs> By this point, you should be okay with the idea that rate of change means slope. And ever since Algebra 1, you've known how to find the slope of a straight line just by looking at it. 
And if you thought in number one that the rate of change or slope was two, and in part B it was negative five, you're right. At this point, you can now pause the video and try your guided practice or your quick check problem.